on. Am I on? I'm showing up on my own phone. You're not showing up on yours? Mic check, can you hear me okay? Mic check. Too loud? Delay. Delay, okay. Oh, great. Awesome. <clears throat> well, hello, everybody. Um, this is the first time I've done uh, Facebook Live on the, on the organizational website, and it's a little bit more complicated than... Just doing it on your own Facebook page like I do for the BSC for meals and all. So anyway, we did figure out where all the... The main thing is to figure out where the ejection seat button is. So we figured that out. <clears throat> so anyway, it's working great. And my trusty guide, Rebecca, Kua Sherper, Rebecca Cheryl Cooper Gentry, you can say her name right, is um, here with Holly the Collie, where she's managing Holly the Collie. So uh, she's also here. So anyway, before we get started... Uh, if you log on, just say hi. Let us know you're out there. Um, this is a new thing for me. Some of you it might, might, might not be so new. If you're looking for something more high tech, you can always switch channels to Joel Osteen or something, you know. So, but here we are together, right? Uh, we appreciate um, the Building and Grounds Committee giving us the recommendation about the this, the ice. We got tons of ice this week, and uh, which made it difficult to manage. Even folks who are good at cleaning up parking lots and roads have had a much tougher time because of all this sleet and ice we had as the lower la layer also uh, it's always fun to share what you're drinking right so don't, uh, don't get too excited i've got herbal tea here with uh i think it's ginger ginger and lemon but i've got my i'm drinking it from my my tron legacy my tron uh, it's not actually Tron Legacy motorcycle um, power run, which is actually a roller coaster in in uh, Tokyo and Tokyo Disney. I think they're supposed to eventually build one here in the United States, so that might be the next time I go to Disney to see that, or maybe go to Tokyo. Wouldn't that be nice? So anyway, uh, I love Tron Legacy. In case you don't know that, but uh, also, if, uh, what are you guys reading right now? Um, I always try to read something to go along with Black History Month, and Becky gave me this book a while back, and I read a few chapters, and it got misplaced. So I'm uh, reading Frederick Douglass's uh, biography by David Blight, which is a fairly new biography of him. Really fascinating, really good read so far. So anyway, who we got here? We got uh, Bob Phillips and uh, Keith and the Morrises. Glad y'all are here. So what else can we talk about? We could get started since it's past 1045. <clears throat> I 
All right, well, I'm going to begin with, um, yeah, let's do announcements. That's a great idea. Uh, so again, uh, well, first of all, we're, we hope to have church at 1289 Lexington Road uh, next Sunday. So we hope to see you back uh, in the in the flesh. And uh, so put us on your calendar. And uh, we have men's night out this week on February 11th. That's Tuesday, 530 at Sedona. So all the guys are welcome. And uh, everyone should have gotten your end of the year giving statements. So uh, we appreciate uh, everyone's giving through last year. And speaking of that, if you were looking at the, the, the giving uh, notes, the, the, our giving is above the budget, which is kind of rare in February. So since we're not there, uh, let's do one of two things, maybe three or four things. First of all, if you, you, all you got to do is log on to church website and you can give through the website digital giving with your credit card a lot of people do that regularly now and if you don't want to do that you can mail a check at 1289 lexington road first baptist church and um but if you're going to mail in something you know you might as well uh send in a a note to aaron our secretary in fact it's nearly valentine's day so let's all send aaron a valentine wouldn't that be cool and um it's time to get into the valentine giving uh mode of the year so get your valentines ready and start sending them out and we're really not too old to do that we all did it in elementary school and it's still a good thing to do and becky's saying it's february the 8th uh why am i saying it's february this tuesday february the 8th right all right but uh i'm glad we got that right at least we know it's tuesday whatever tuesday is All right, any other announcements out there? Somebody could just post announcements on the comment board. Uh, if there happen to be any college students out there, we are having our family meal tonight at six o'clock. And um, my favorite, one of my favorite Iranian students, uh, Zara is cooking some of her home cooked meal recipes tonight. She hasn't told me what it is. She went shopping last night and she did two meals for us back in the fall and they were awesome. So we're looking forward to that. So again, welcome. Glad you could join us online. Glad you're here and glad uh, you could spend this time with us this morning. I'm going to start off by reading a psalm, Psalm 138, a psalm of thanksgiving and praise. And we uh, use the new revised standard version most of the time here at First Baptist. Psalm 138. I give thanks. I give you thanks, O Lord, from, with my whole heart before the gods. I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name and for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. On the day I called you, answer me. You increase my strength of soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord, and for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he, preserve, he perceives from afar away. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve me against the wrath of my enemies. You stretch out your hand, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Let's pray together. Oh God, we thank you for this beautiful day where we can gather together. Uh, we're grateful to have a place where we can normally gather together physically under one roof. But we're also grateful for this technology where we can connect with one another and, and share together in this fashion. May we open our hearts and our minds and our very beings to your spirit as we continue together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Second scripture reading is from the book of Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. 
Seraphs were in attendance with him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And I'm thinking right now, I know what hymn we'd be singing if we'd be in church together. Isn't that right, minister music? Verse 4. The pivots of the threshold shook at the voice of those called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me! I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth and with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am I. Start over. Here I am I. Send me. <clears throat> I want to read over our prayer list, and Bob is reminding us, if you're a golfer out there, we do have our annual golf, the BSC annual golf tournament coming up on May the 9th, and uh, hope you put that on your calendar. It'll be a great Mother's Day gift. We re um, request for prayer, and I'm just reading down from the newsletter, Tammy Despain, Floyd Lockhart, Margie George, Marie Wynn, Marie Wren, John Miskell, Ron Winstead, Kim Moxie, Dean Richardson, and Scott Marie Wren, Bob Phillips, Donna Delgado, Larry Sadler, Jelani Lockhart, Linda Durden, Jerry Watkins, Adlin Stewart, Finley Maddox, Bob White, Dale Watkins, Linda Little, Darla Gibbons, Craig Pohl, Leda Wise, Wayne Malugan, Pat Honey, Ruth Brown, David Blotner, Rosie Hendry, Pat Lee, Bruce and Team Durden, Bev Reeves, Joe Blattner, and Margie Sasso. We'd also like to remember those in retirement care this morning, Myron Dillo, Helen Hammond, Mary Miller, Kathy Anderson, Kara Malugan, Louise Harris, Leda Wise, Kim Moxie, Louise Hagler, Merlin Cummings, Maureen Sadler, Pat Robbins, Adeline Stewart, Jerry Watkins, Dale Watkins, and Rosemary Weaver. Also, if you can think of other folks, uh, to add on the prayer list, just type them down and we'll get them added to the prayer list. I'd also like for us to remember my friend Dan Dyer and also my brother Rob and Thera Gentry. They have been struggling greatly with COVID the past over a week now. Let's pray again together. Oh God, we thank you for this first day of the week where we rise to celebrate the resurrection May your life kindle our hearts and our, our hearts together, even though we worship apart this morning. May we experience your light and your life as we continue through this experience and begin another week. And in this moment, we remember those whose names we have just read. We also pray for our health care workers who work long shifts under a lot of duress during this long pandemic. We pray for their strength and resolve. We pray for our teachers and those who work in education who are often maligned and criticized. May they be strengthened and encouraged and realize that they are carrying the light and hope for tomorrow by inspiring the young. We pray for the leaders of our communities, our nation and world. We pray for wisdom, inspired leadership and common sense. May all weigh the needs of the many against the needs of the few, but yet serve the needs of all. We pray for workers around the world who keep life going day after day. Postal workers, the folks who pick up our trash and recycling, the MDOT workers, 
Friends working up on power lines and sub-zero weather. Friends who check us out at the grocery store and bag our items and sometimes even carry it to the car. The police officers who show up when there's a wreck or someone calls and we're in trouble. And all the children who have learned to adapt under these difficult changing circumstances. May we see every soul as you see every soul. And may we be transformed by your love for us and our love for one another. May we have the courage to move when you move us. Amen. Sermon title today, today is, You Asked Me to Do What? Which is from the Gospel of Luke chapter 5, reading the first 11 verses. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The, the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but we've caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners and other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of the fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid, from now on you will be catching people. And when they, ha when they have brought their sh boats to the shore, they left everything and followed him. <clears throat> One of the oldest symbols of the Christian faith is the symbol of the fish. The simple outline of the fish. You've probably seen it in places. The often told story is that during times of persecution, when two strangers will meet along the way, a Christian would draw one half of the symbol in the dust. And if the other, if the other stranger happened to be a Christian, would complete the drawing and they would secretly know that they are both Christ followers. Most people think of the cross with Christianity because the cross is so prominently displayed on churches, in churches, in sanctuary, on jewelry. But the cross really took centuries to become an important physical symbol of Christian faith. And I'm thinking if you witnessed a crucifixion or had someone you loved or someone you had known crucified, that might explain why it took a long time for the cross to be a symbol of a physical symbol of, of faith. But think about the importance of the fish symbol and its connection to the New Testament. Peter and a large portion of the first disciples were fishermen, far more than any other occupation, which may have greatly affected the environment of these early disciples because they were mostly fishermen. Just think about that. How would, how would fishermen or a majority of fishermen set a tone for Jesus' group. You probably have some outdoorsmen and they know how to cook and that would be a great thing where you're an itinerant preacher with an entourage. They certainly would have known what work was. Early risers, their can-do people, and the ability to work long hours together for a common goal. And when things get bad, fishermen know how to hang in there. Jesus' blessing of the loaves and the fish to feed the multitudes was one of the most important stories in the Gospels and one of the few stories that was told by all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The story depicted Jesus as the source of life for the people and the importance of taking care of everybody. God can use simple, ordinary people to do extraordinary things. 
The fish can symbolize new beginnings and transformation. The second century te uh, leader Tertullian said that Christians are caught in the net of salvation and made members of the heavenly kingdom. We are the small fishes, Tertullian said, born in the waters of baptism. So the fish symbol was one of those important symbols connecting uh, life to baptism and the Lord's Supper. The fish symbolized new life and thriving in the life of God and thus symbolizing Christian identity for a long time. So here in today's text from Luke 5, Luke is recounting the early part in Jesus' ministry and beginning the story of Jesus' call to his disciples. Luke does emphasize how he called them from their occupations, all of them from their, their daily work, which for us here in Cape Girardeau is like going down the Mississippi and making disciples of the dot workers or the people on the tugboats. Jesus was very close to Peter's family. After his inaugural Nazareth sermon, which is in chapter 4, where Jesus left town with his life, passed on through, he headed to Capernaum down on the coast, and he entered Simon Peter's house and, and healed his mother-in-law who was suffering from a life-threatening high fever. Capernaum, this prominent fishing village, became the hub of Jesus' early ministry. Jesus then headed out on his speaking tour around the Sea of Galilee where either Peter worked or had a working fishing business. I am tempted to think that Simon Peter was more of a man of means than what we sometimes assume. If he had a house in Caesarea and a boat on the lake and a business to boot, then Peter would have had some resources. Peter's house is thought to have been an early center of Christian work and mission. And the story is one of the most important or most remembered stories of the early Christian church and originally told by fishermen. This story we're reading now. We'll come back to Peter's house in a moment. But here in this story, Luke told how Jesus called this people from their occupations to participate actively in the kingdom of God. So in our culture, I guess I should be more specific and say my culture, I don't uh, we often don't think of fishing as work. We think of fishing as recreation. Although you may have to get up at 4 a.m. to get your equipment ready, head out, check your gear, drive, unload, which is a lot of work too. But despite all that work to go fishing, your life does not depend on it. In my northeastern Alabama culture, we tend to think of fishing as a sport. I grew up a few miles from the Coosa River, and my daddy invested in a bass boat that had a Mercury 85 horsepower outboard motor on it. And, I, and so I grew up fishing, but also learned how to water ski, which that's a whole other story. I have to find a, another passage to fit water skiing in. But my, my brother married into the Curvin family. And one of the, last, uh, one of the things that the Curvins were known for were, were having people in the family who were master fishermen. They were known for entering fishing tournaments and often winning them. And so the sport of fishing is a huge part of my culture, and, and today it's bigger now than ever. In tourist locations, you can visit the Bass Pro Shop, and that has this huge selection of all kinds of equipment that's and, and specialized fishing. There's a lot of a sport to fishing, right? There's, there's bass and trout, catfish and crappie. Uh, you can be an angler or a fly fisherman, or you can lay a trot line like our Native American ancestors taught. I grew up watching Bill dance outdoors on TV and still remember his good advice at the end of every show where he went to different places and fished. And he always said, keep what you can use and release the rest. That's still good advice. So coming back to Luke's story, though... The context of fishing here has very little to do with fishing in our recreational culture. It's fishing for livelihood, fishing for work, fishing for a living. More than a few preachers have used sport fishing as a metaphor for evangelism. Jesus did tell his disciples that they were going to be fishers of people. But in American Christianity, churches have used all sorts of gimmicks to invite people with some kind of entrapment or marketing strategy, almost like you're using lures or bait to, to, uh, 
to, to get people to come in. But this kind of approach, in my opinion, is not that genuine. And most people today have caught up to the fact because they have run into this strategy so, so much of their lives. Unfortunately, folks today can be extremely suspicious of Christianity because they wonder, well, what's the catch? What, what's the catch to what you guys are offering? Maybe you've watched some of those reality TV shows about fishing. A lot of these shows demonstrate the hard work and potential dangers of fishing. They show how the fishing and how really hard work it is. There's the deadliest catch, swords, life on the line, and wicked tuna. Maybe you've seen the, the movie The Perfect Storm that came out back in the year 2000. It was based on a book. And in this movie, what was it, George Clooney in that one? Um, it's been a while since I've seen it. In this movie, based on the, the real story, the fishing team is trying to push the limits of where they are going to get the big fish, which puts them in harm's way of the weather, thus the perfect storm. Fishing can be dangerous because you're out there with the elements. The industry of fishing is hard work. I've met several students who have spent summers traveling up to Alaska to work in the salmon industry, and they've described the, the hard work but the good pay which takes them up there. And this is the kind of fishing Luke is talking about. Folks who fish every day for a living, and it can be hard and sometimes dangerous work. So imagine these fishermen out there along the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee on that early morning, and they had been working hard all night, right? And for these Sea of Galilee fishermen, their boats and the nets were their livelihood. It was everything. You had to mend and take care of the nets. And it's thought that in the ancient fishing industry, fishermen spent the night fishing so that the fish could be processed in the markets at the opening in the morning. And the night was also the best time to fish because the fish tended to feed at night. And plus it was dark and they would not be able to dodge the nets coming their way. So after a night of fishing, there was the work of unloading the boat, cleaning the fish, if you caught any, washing the nets, and putting everything in its proper place. Now, normally Simon Peter would have been about this business, but he was a guy who couldn't say no, particularly to Jesus, right? He couldn't say no to Jesus. Peter could not say, I'm too busy to Jesus, because, you know, this guy lived in his own house, this itinerant preacher, so Peter owed Jesus big time because he had healed his own mama of a terrible fever. And in Near Eastern culture, you're always reciprocating to people who help you. And so you always want the, the, ba the, the balance ledger to even out with people. So the text really doesn't tell us whose idea of putting the, the boat out father was. Jesus was looking for a better way to address the crowd and using a boat as a stage could have been Peter's idea, could have been Jesus' idea. But whether Peter initially offered or Jesus initially asked, it's not, it's not important. But the point here is that Jesus had a genuine need and Peter helped him out with the whole boat thing. <clears throat> Meeting Jesus' need was the first step in Peter's discipleship. We, kind of, we cannot imagine the potential of offering someone a job and how that can make all the difference in the world. That is one thing that churches like ours should be good at, giving people something to do to engage them, not, not to catch them or trick them, or, but because we have a genuine need and you can help us. And it's critical help, needed help. I remember years ago... Uh, we had a prayer meeting at the BSC with a bunch of students and, and one of the young ladies laid her hands on me and said, you know, I, I really appreciate the mission trips you take us on because where we go, it's not token help. It's really needed help. And uh, back then it was like just after Katrina and, and, and had done some other things. And that, that testimony still sticks with me. The Christian author and future thinker Leonard Sweet once told the story that the pastor in the church he attended as a teenager asked him to be the church organist. Leonard said that 
If that had not happened in his life, he might not have even stuck with the church at all. You know, and actually that's Becky's story too. She became the church organist in First Baptist Church of Atmore, Alabama, not too far from the Florida line. At the wise age of 16, after serving as the fill-in piano player since 8th grade. Becky served as the church organist until she left for college, which, you know, she did a two-year degree at the community college down there, so that was a little while. And Becky's story is a lot like Leonard Sweet's story. She said, I could get her down here to testify. I didn't really think about that. Maybe I should, but maybe I shouldn't. I don't know. But anyway, she did say, if I hadn't been asked to play the organ, I probably wouldn't be here at church. And I probably wouldn't have had much to do with church either. If I had not been the, the church organist, I would most likely have spent more Sundays down at Gulf Shores with a lot of my friends. I'm sure she's right. In Tyler's last sermon here at FBC, which is now well over two years ago, Tyler mentioned how I, as the director of the BSC, just pitched the idea of working of Tyler working for the BSC as an intern just in one conversation on the sidewalk. And that's true. It just happened. You can really open someone's future by giving them something meaningful to do. Something we should think about in our world today, in our church today. So instead of doing his normal cleanup routine, Peter was eager to help Jesus and let Jesus hop in his boat so that the boat could serve as a kind of pulpit so Jesus could be heard by the crowds on the shoreline. You know sound travels better over water. So who knows whether that was Jesus' idea, or maybe it was Peter's idea. But so um, I can imagine Peter saying, hey, Jesus, let's try this. Why don't you get in the boat? And Jesus like, great man, let's go. And then he's preaching the sermon, sitting down in the boat, preaching the sermon. It's hard to know how long Jesus preached, but when he was done, I'm sure Simon Peter was ready to get back to his routine of unloading the boat, cleaning up, washing the nets, etc., because it had been a long night of fishing for nothing. It's highly possible that a lot of things ran through Peter's mind. I mean, Peter did have a fishing business to run. Well, Jesus, great sermon. It's, it's time to head in for the day, right? I mean, there's a few things probably more frustrating than a fisherman who spent all night fishing and catching nothing. Not to mention having to clean up after all that work of, in, of not catching anything. Um, and Peter's thinking about, I've got to help this traveling preacher. So think about it. You've been up all night again. And he looks to and Jesus. We all expect Jesus to say to Peter, well, thanks, Peter, for letting me use your boat and rowing us out here and managing the placement on the water. Let's head back to the shore and order some tacos. But what does Jesus say to his fisherman friend, Simon Peter? Put out into the deep water and let your nets and let down your nets for a catch. Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Now you can imagine a little silence there with Peter hearing those words, maybe a little shock. Thinking about what Jesus was, was asking. You want me to do what? I've worked all night. Been sitting here listening to you. This is Peter's mind. What all could I be doing now? And now you want me to row out to the deep water. Which is more work. Okay Jesus. You're, a, you're the landlubber carpenter's son. You are the rabbi. I'm the fisherman. Let's all stick to our roles. Plus now you say... Let down your nets for a catch. We've been fishing all night when we're, and, we're, and we're, we were supposed to catch fish. We're not going to catch fish here in the heat of the day. Go out into the deep water, you say. Every fisherman knows that the best fishing is just past the shallows where the river water flows into the sea. That's where the fish are. The deep water is pointless. Plus, we're all tired. That's Peter's mind. But then Peter is thinking about this rabbi that's been living with him for who knows how long in his house. And then he thinks about mama and how great mama's doing. 
And so Peter probably doesn't hesitate when he thinks about Mama doing so well after Jesus has healed her from this fever. <clears throat> In the Greek, Peter calls Jesus epistates, which is in a certain contexts can mean head honcho. So we can kind of picture Peter cynically saying in a passive aggressive way, okay, we have fished all night and caught nothing. However, you're the boss. You're the boss man. So Peter does exactly as Jesus says, and then immediately there's this great catch. It is miraculous. It's illogical. Something not expected by any fisherman. Peter had won the fishing lottery. And the Greek simply reads that he signaled his business partners to come over and help because his nets were about to rip away. It's kind of fun to imagine what would signaling mean because we know that sound carries over the water. What, what is it some kind of known fishing international sign or is it like, you know, I don't know. It's fun to think about that. So signaling makes sense because all the fishermen wanted to keep the best spots of where the fish are biting secret. But, you know, Peter's signal was probably frantic. But Jesus has confronted Peter right at where he was most knowledgeable, right where he was the expert, right where he had done well, right where he had made a living, right where he had made it his life's work. He had a great business, he had a great family, and a great house right there in Caesarea. But the great catch is shocking because what is even more dramatic is that here Peter is confronted with a choice of what really matters. What is the meaning of life? Is it making a living and having a great business or job? Is it working hard and taking care of everyone around you? Is it having all the money and resources you need? Peter was taking in the amount of fish that nearly swamped both boats that would have set his business financially for a long, long time in an early retirement. Kenneth Bailey, the great Near Eastern teacher, set the drama of what was confronting Peter. The first thought that likely came to Peter's mind was that Jesus somehow discovered a new spring that hope had opened up in the floor of the lake where the fish were gathering. Peter knew full well that any person with such knowledge could become very rich in a matter of weeks. So why was Jesus, a penniless rabbi, without a real job, wandering around teaching people for nothing? How could God possibly be more important than two boatloads of fish? Evidently, Jesus cared more about God and people than he did about acquiring wealth. Who was this man who made such an amazing decision? Peter found himself face to face with a person who challenged his priori priorities on the deepest level. Peter's reaction is based on Isaiah 6, the text we read earlier. Peter suddenly staring at the holiness of God and realizing that how short he had fallen. He pleaded with Jesus to depart, for he was a sinful man. And this is the first time Luke uses the word sinner in, the go in his gospel. That introduces one of Luke's major themes in his gospel. That Jesus is always a friend to sinners and calls them to be a part of the kingdom of God as brothers and sisters, as one family. So before, Jesus, uh, before Peter had referred to Jesus as boss man, but now he refers to Jesus as Lord, Curios, Lord. The simple story is so full of symbolism. There is an allusion to the communion of the Lord's table here in the story. For Peter, for, for, the, for P, this Peter and the citizens of Caesarea, fish was their diet and means of eating and living. For those who Abide in Christ to use the language from the Gospel of John, we find Christ to be our source for living each day. The point of being a disciple is not really based upon if you leave or if you stay, but really it's finding whatever your work or whatever your life may be, and in that you find the living presence of Christ in what you do and how you live each day. Each day is transformation into God's work and wonder. So Jesus pronounced a transformation of Peter, that Peter will be transformed from being a fisherman to one who fishes for people, for two legs. Literally, from the Greek, the sense is to catch alive.
to catch alive. It's something, there's some subtlety in this part of the story that we often read over in, in the English translation. <clears throat> Still, when I read this in English, my first thought, being from Northeast Alabama, is I'm thinking about that I used to catch fish and put them on a stringer and place the stringer in the water to keep them alive for a little while. Or if I was in a boat, we'd put them in an aerator, right? The, which is deep well, had water in it, and kept oxygen in the water to keep the fish. The point of both is to keep fish alive until you take them home and clean them for consumption. Or to put them in the freezer for later. But this is not what the story is saying. Peter caught fish for, for the market, which meant likewise. They killed them for food. But now Peter will focus on catching people alive to give life to people. To help give them a place to thrive, to flourish. Now Peter would help give life to people where they could thrive in this world that God had created. Peter changed jobs. And he puts his life into Jesus' hands and, and along with a few of his business associates. James and John. Peter's own house is probably one of the most interestingly archaeological finds from the New Testament. The house was first discovered in 1968. Well, we think it's Peter's house, right? I mean, it doesn't say Peter lived here, so we kind of 90% think it's Peter's house. But the house was first discovered in 1968 by Franciscan archaeologists. It was an extensive house for its time, but was built earlier, meaning Peter would have prob must have purchased the house. The house had three courts around, uh, which were arranged several rooms. And it's believed the largest room was converted into a house church where people gathered on a paved floor. Christian emblems and graffiti have been found on the wall in at least four languages where the early church expanded. Greek, Syriac, Aramaic, and Latin. The house became an international center in just a few years. The house became a place of pilgrimage for centuries. And in the 5th century, the house was torn down and an octagonal church was built upon it. And the point of all this is to consider Peter being told to catch people alive, create a space for thriving. His entire family and resources were implemented to serve Jesus and his movement and the early Christian movement. He used his home to be a center of hospitality that made an impact for over 400 years. Small ripples with a big impact from this simple fisherman. I think Peter's example is one for all of us to consider how you can use your home, your time, the resources that God that has given you to create an environment of flourishing for other folk. Jesus still makes us ask important questions about what is really important, even while we are trying to figure out what's going on in this world we are in today. So three points in uh, closing this is a long closing so don't grab your hat and coat yet <clears throat> number one frustration and exasperation are par for the course in ministry in church work you may be able to relate to peter and all your work in your life and, and trying to help out and you may be saying i have done this before with very little results and now i am just tired and i'm done my time is too valuable to put this ministry into this ministry thing without too much payback without too many results and yet Jesus tells us to do something that may seem irrational counterintuitive even against common sense like throwing your nets out into the deep water it takes a bit of humbleness to trust God in situations like these if we work for Jesus we better be prepared for the blessing, though. The blessing is often ambiguous. It's usually beyond what we expect. The blessing for us is G with Jesus, people, is living joyfully in the life of God. And beyond that, living joyfully, living in joyful relationship with one another. <clears throat> the singer-songwriter Bruce Springsteen refers to this finding way of life in his song, After Groping Through Darkness, it's one of my favorite songs of his called The Rising. To me, the song is about embracing the life or the task of living that is before you, despite the horror or the darkness that you've what you've been through. In one of the latter verses, it, he sings, 
May I feel your arms around me. May I feel your blood mixed with mine. A dream of life comes to me. Like catfish jumping on the end of my line. So in these lyrics, Springsteen links religious experience of rising from darkness and death and ashes of despair and compares it to the joy of catching a fish. So if you don't get the joy of that reference, then you may have never caught a fish. Or maybe you've never experienced the of waiting and watching that cork bobble in the water and suddenly it goes down. You know you're, you've caught something. There's a lot of joy in that. Springsteen's song and album was his post 9-11 album and the first album he had worked on with the E Street Band since 1984's Born in the USA, which wouldn't have been about 18 years, almost two decades. Bruce, who is also known as the boss, was depressed with the aftermath of 9-11 about the calls for vengeance and the rising persecution of minorities in our country. And Springsteen said that this album can be traced back to one instance in his life when a stranger drove up beside him in traffic and recognized him through the window next door. The stranger rolled down the window and shouted, We need you now! And then that's the genesis for his songwriting to, to reboot again. Simple asking. We need you now. Never underestimate asking for the need. Never apologize for it. Jesus didn't. Hey, Peter, I need a boat. Point number two. Sometimes, though, it takes only one more act of faithfulness to produce a miracle, to produce something greater. Remember another Luke in parable of the lost things in chapter 15. The lost sheep was found because the shepherd kept on looking. You keep looking, you keep fishing, you keep being faithful. You're out to deep water one more time even though you think it's crazy. The difference could be your willingness to reach out one more time when you feel like it's the last thing you need to be doing or have time to be doing or have energy to be doing. And more times than not, when I have calls for help in ministry, the folks on the other end with abundance who have seem to have abundant energy to help are those people I would think are the, the least able because of what they've been through and been overwhelmed in their own lives and been dealing with so much. Yet they still find another way to give out of God's abundance. Beyond the job of ministry, of checking off things that you have to do or that you have to get ready for, think of investing your life in other people. You are fishing for people to give life, not to create a name for yourself, but to invest your life into them and to create a space of living, a space of thriving for people. Number three, the importance of Peter's house, if this is a thing, and I think it is, is Peter may have left everything, but this does not mean you necessarily get rid of everything. He turned his livelihood and his resources into ways to serve God and others. Peter's house stands as a symbol of what the ripples of work and commitment can be for people through time. Think about the places that have stood to serve through the test of time. The next time you see the Christian fish symbol, think about something radical. Think about fish and what it takes for them to thrive. Fish need a place to thrive, and so do people. I need a place to thrive. You need a place to thrive. We all need places to be what God has called us to be and to thrive and to thrive together in God's community. How can we use our spaces to create a place for people to thrive? Our church, our facilities, our homes, and the spaces between the to and the fro of our daily lives. God can transform those places and those spaces if we'll just live lives of transformation and live in the moment of His Spirit. Do you ever get tired of working? Do you ever get tired of fishing? I'm sure we all do. But if we listen to the voice of Jesus, I think we can hear Him speak of a dream of life. A dream of life for all of us. A call to go out into the deep waters and cast the nets. 
Let's dream of life, of thriving together. Amen. And now for our benediction. This is from the, the Prague reformer John Huss. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world, for only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us by your Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, we hope to see everybody back together again next Sunday. And uh, remember, uh, give online if you haven't given already. Send a check in the mail, 28, uh, 1289 Lexington Road, Cape Girardeau, Missouri, 63701. And uh, remember, men's night out on Tuesday night. And... Um, other events coming up as well. Uh, check out our newsletter. And send folks some Valentine's. Valentine's Day is coming up. Don't forget the ministry of encouragement. We all need it in this day and age. So, uh, so thanks for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you again soon. God bless y'all. Take care. Bye-bye.